Success Insight shares the stories of the people with passion and drive who make things happen in the world. Here's your host, Howard Fox. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Coaching and Consulting Insight Series on the Success Insight Podcast. Our guest today is Jay McAllister. Jay is the CEO of Paragon Tech Incorporated. He is the consummate relationship builder and is passionate about being an invaluable resource for an ever-expanding network, especially in a reborn, highly virtual world. Jay, welcome to Coaching and Consulting Insights on the Success Insight Podcast. Hey, hey, Howard. How are you? Fantastic. Now, for our listeners, in the spirit of full disclosure, I have a lot of disclosures over the years. I know Jay, and because we were involved in, in a networking group back in Chicago, and it's just really great to get to know him. And I saw him on a, a Facebook post this week, and I thought, you know, I need to connect with Jay and get him on this podcast. So, Jay, again, thank you for uh, joining me today. Absolutely. That just highlights the intentionality that you operate with, my friend. Fantastic. Thank you. Now, before we kind of get into the relationship building, you know, let's talk a little bit, if you would, about your background, just to kind of give our listeners a flavor for who is Jay McAllister. And, and then we'll kind of dive into the business and to the relationship building. So it, it's your platform now. Yeah. You know, everybody loves a good origin story. Yeah. Look elsewhere than here. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's, it's speaking of origin story, I'm a, so I'm a big Marvel superhero fan. Love it. Ever since I've been, you know, able to talk. My dad was showing me comic books that he collected over the years as he was a child. And I learned about these fantastic stories of Spider-Man and, you know, and the Hulk and all these characters that now are coming, to, they're coming to life uh, on screen before our eyes. But, you know, as far as my origin story, I was always the problem child. You know, the terrible twos. Really? They, they never ended. They, they, they persisted. And, and I was constantly, you know, I was in school. I was, a, I was a challenge to deal with from teach from a teacher's perspective. You know, and the reason why teachers would tell me that I was lazy and that I was unmotivated. And what they didn't realize at the time was that I've always had a very curious mind. And my curiosity has it's got me in a little bit of trouble, but it's also, it's, it's allowed me to explore so many areas of, of my personality and, and of the world and the universe we live in. I was a tinkerer. So from the minute that I could pick up a, an electronic device, I was starting to take apart remote controls at my house. And you were one of those kids. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was me. You know, and by the way, I, I I, I purposely left out the part where I put the remote controls back together because I hadn't developed that skill set yet. But okay. this was the foundational elements of me learning how technology works. It's like you take this complex system and you break it down in its individual components and realize it's actually not that complex. So it, I, I had a Game Boy Advance. This was a, kind of my first foray into technology. And at the time, I think I was in third grade, we would all play this game on our Game Boys called Pokemon. Right. And our I went to private school and our, our cool factor was directly influenced by how many Pokemon we had in this game. I mean, it was just it took over our whole grade. And I remember figuring out a way by just tinkering with it, with the controls and, you know, and, and with the code of the game is in a very rudimentary format. At that time, I figured out a way to elevate my performance, to give myself access to more Pokemon. So as you can imagine, my cool factor skyrocketed. You were like Captain Kirk in the Kobayashi Maru, Absolutely. You know, the no win scenario. You, you like, okay, I got, I got this. <laughs> I got, yeah. You know, I consider myself more of the MacGyver type, but you know, okay. Captain Kirk, we, we'll go with either reference. Right. And I remember I had a buddy who said, he noticed what I was doing. He's like, man, that is so cool. Can you do that to my game? And by the way, I'll pay you. Uh -huh. Boom. Light bulb moment. That's where it dawned on me that by having a technical skill set, it was valuable to other people, even to the point of they were willing to depart with their cold, hard cash in exchange for that. Right. Yeah. And at the time, you know, we're third grade. It, it took off like wildfire. And I started doing it for all my friends. Again, this is our current. This is our social currency. And after about a week or two of doing this, my parents started receiving phone calls from parents who were dissatisfied with the fact that they're. Their children didn't have any lunch money. 
for school. They're like, they're not eating food. They're giving it to your son, I think. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> so my wow. parents shut it down, you know, they shut that down. And that, that pretty much persisted throughout my entire school career. I was more focused on technology tinkering than doing homework and assignments that were given to me by teachers who said, you need to learn how to do calculus. You need to learn how to, you know, about history. You need to learn about scientific equations and how to balance, you know, those kind of things. While useful, my focus was all about technology. That's fantastic. You know, we do a, a podcast series called the author series. And one of the authors, a couple of them that I've had on, you know, they were, they were writers. So not only writing a book, but many books and writing has been a part of their life since they've been very young. And, and a couple of them would say, you know, I help my friends write papers. Now, one of them actually got paid by her friends to write their paper. Another one didn't take any money, but I'm thinking to myself, man, that is a great side hustle. So with your tinkering, I'm thinking, you know, once the parents figure out that they don't have to send the computer off to heaven knows where to get it repaired, there's, there's Jay McAllister, you know, now he becomes valuable. Now you've, but you already had your entrepreneurial spirit and you had that side hustle going. Yeah. I don't think I knew I, I, I probably didn't speak on the topic as eloquently as you just described it there, but I knew there was something there and I was still, my, my young mind was trying to grapple with what I had just discovered. Fast forward to high school, I think it was my senior year, I, I got into 3D modeling and animation. And I remember taking a class my senior year and the class was a 3D modeling class. This is the first time ever where I was able to take a class that actually aligned with my interests. So I was excited. I was pumped. I showed up to class. And I remember the first day coming into class, we get into the content and the teacher shows us how to make a, a cube in 3D space, you know, just a simple cube. You're like, yep, we're, you know, next week we're going to make two cubes. And the week after that, maybe we'll get make three. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, I had already started doing other things in 3D modeling. I'm building houses and putting furniture inside. I'm like, we're making cubes. So I went off on my own in the class because now I had the equipment, a computer that was powerful enough to do what I couldn't do at home. And I started making a, it was a cloth simulation where there was basically a flag waving. I had wind blowing and I was throwing these objects at the cloth and the cloth was actually ripping and shredding in real time as, pretty complex simulation and then I remember during mid mid class while the teacher is instructing he saw my screen and he stops the class he's Jay what are you doing shut that down and stay after class and talk to me and I go great you know again I'm used to being the problem child Uh, we're just going to add another detention to the list no big deal and I stay after class he instructs me to open up what I was working on and I open it up and he tells me this is amazing how did you learn how to do this? And I'm like, well, you know, this, this is what you do to change this setting. And he goes, I'm not, I got to level with you. Our curriculum is trash. He's like, we, we're making cubes for the whole semester. He's like, this is what we need to be doing. This is interesting. So what I would like for you to do is I would like for you to tutor me and show me how you're doing this. And then that will become our curriculum. Wow. And of course, I, ch- I remembered back to third grade. So I said, yeah, I'd love to do that. And I think $20 per session would be just fine. And, and he agreed to it. So oh, wow. we do our sessions every day after class, 20 bucks, do the math. That's a hundred bucks a week. So I was feeling pretty good about that. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> wow. I learned the fir- first major lesson, which is, it was just keep your big mouth shut. Of course, I couldn't keep that to myself. I thought it was the coolest thing. I'm paying, you know, teachers paying me to show him how to 3d model and the school shut that down shortly after they got word, they, they got word of it. Yeah. So sometimes it pays to be a little more discreet, but so how did you end up in a, in the business with Paragon tech? Did you, you know, and I I suspect, and you'll tell me if I'm wrong and that's quite all right. You, you're very comfortable in a space that you control. Here's what we're going to do. Here's how I'm going to do it. Here's the resources I need to help my team, me, my customers do it, as opposed to going, I mean, I, I worked for two IT companies in my life. It was brutal. I mean, I tell people, Jay, I'm a recovering IT business consultant. Okay. 
And because I don't like being told you have to do this, you have to do that. I, w- did you go into, you know, working for a company, a tech company, or did you decide, you know, I'm going to start my own business. There's a need here I can fill. How did that come about? Yeah, just to, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a complex story, but I'll break it down in a, a simple explanation. I started working for a tech company, a local tech company that provided maintenance for, you know, for consumer level maintenance, virus removal, screen replacements. I started working for them. And that's where I was able to explore in a, in a, in a business aspect, in a business setting. And I was able to see how revenue was generated by companies. How do you build clients and those kind of things. And there was a gentleman who I, I was also, I started college as well. My parents were both first generation college graduates. College was always very important in my household. Went to private school, went to a great high school in Lincoln Way area, go, go Griffins, you know, and they were always concerned about the next step was college. So I went to college while working for this technology company. And a gentleman walks in one day, his name was Evan Galvin, and he ran a wireless internet service provider called XL Broadband. And he asked me, you know, he, I, he needed something fixed on his computer. And he asked me, he said, you seem to you really know your stuff. You know, have you ever thought about doing this on your own? And at that point, I hadn't given it much thought, but that was the spark that I needed to think, like, wow, maybe I could do this on my own. Well, we want, I winded up texting him and saying, hey, I'd like to come learn and see what you're doing in your business. And he was pretty young at the time as well. I think he's just about 30 years old. And we actually winded up becoming really good friends. And I remember one day, this was probably two years after that, he was uh, going to, he was taking a flight and I was driving him to the airport. And in the car, he, wa- he was listening to an audio book, which was e by Michael Gerber. Oh, yeah. And it's all about, it's, you're not head nods, I know a popular one in the business community. It's all about the concept of starting a business and the difference between being the practitioner or the technician and then being able to switch hats and then work on the business versus in the business. And I was just fascinated with this concept. He got on his flight. I drove home, finished the rest of the audio book. As soon as I pulled in my garage, I opened up my web browser and I unenrolled from college and I drafted a resignation letter from my job. And that was the catalyst. I mean, that's the last push I needed. I just needed to know one. I think it was the fact that he was doing it well and successfully my friend Evan and I had now the tangible tools at at least at the time I thought I had all the tools I needed to start a business that was viable. Very cool now how long did it take you know so that you know let's just say pre-COVID I mean you you and I met you know 2018-2019 time frame at Chris Johnson's uh, networking group and you had already had Paragon, Paragon Tech at the time. Right. So how did you, how, how did it come about that you kind of grew that business and de- get your customer base and develop the, you know, here's the services I'm going to provide or here's the team I'm going to be pulling in to help deliver these services. How long of a journey was that? So when I was working at the tech consulting company, there were several of our customers who came in who had you know, residential computer issues, but they mentioned that they had a business and they asked if I was able to help them there. Now that company, they didn't, they weren't involved in the business world at all. They didn't right. do any business IT maintenance. So the first thing I did is call up those clients and said, Hey, you know, I would be able to help you with your business. So immediately I had a, a decent book of business from just relationships I had made working at that company. And I did that for a while. You know, industry agnostic was one of the terms that I, I used sure. to describe my services and, and the kind of clients that I served. And I realized that I needed a stickier relationship. We had, a, you know, I was learning about numbers like churn and cost of acquisition. And I realized that we needed, in order to gain critical mass, I needed to be able to retain clients that viewed our service as a very high value service, critical to their business. So I decided to specialize in the vertical of the legal profession, working with attorneys and law firms. Sure. I realized that there were certain requirements that law firms had in order to operate, and they were constrained by the amount of time they had. And a lot of attorneys, you know, in order to elevate their practice, the, the thought was that if I just work harder and put more blood, sweat, and tears into my work product, I will be more successful. 
And I realized that there were software platforms that already existed out there that if we could pick, if we could pick the best systems, put it together to create a cohesive ecosystem that we would actually be able to increase the efficiency of attorneys. And especially in an industry where the, the billable hour is so critical, right? The time saving just becomes a metric that it allows them to be more profitable. So that's where we decided to focus on at the time. It was just me. And as soon as we started focusing that vertical, I started meeting with attorneys. I actually, my first task was I set out, I interviewed a hundred attorneys in Chicago and their support staff to find out what are the core issues that they face. And I started the, the, the first task was, task was to tackle those things that took okay. off like wildfire. So I was able to start hiring employees. And I realized in that time frame that although I was the technician, I really was starting to enjoy this thing called business. This nebulous concept for me that it was before was starting to take form. And I realized that the relationship building aspect, the, all the steps required to bring an idea into the tactical steps that needed to be take to, that needed to be executed on in order to bring us to where we want to be as an organization. Very cool. Now, you know, I definitely want to get into the relationship side, but let, let's talk a little bit about this past year, 2020 and 2021, the age of COVID. How did the business evolve? because of COVID and all of a sudden nobody's working in an office anymore. We're working from home. How did, how did you kind of adapt pivot to that type of uh, constraint? Yeah. So COVID was tough for my business. It's one of those things where it, it's a, it's a strange phenomenon because you would expect that COVID the world turned virtual almost overnight. I mean, meetings that were in person were now transitioned to Zoom meetings. And we all adapted relatively quickly. So you would imagine that my company being in the technology space would experience unprecedented, uh, unprecedented levels of growth and, uh, and it would be rocket fuel to our business model. I saw the exact opposite, actually. Okay. What, what happened is that given the fact that we decided to, to focus on the legal profession, that was one of the professions where there was so much uncertainty about what's next. You know, attorneys were working from home. Their support staff were working from home. Are we going to keep the, the big office space or are we going to downsize? How are we going to handle payroll? Are we eligible for PPP? So a lot of the firms that we worked with, they went, the firms that we worked with, as well as firms that we were not yet working with, they went into preservation mode. Let's just, let's just life float until we figure out what this whole pandemic situation looks like. And let's face it, by the, the, the avenue that we decided to take, which made us get, which created stickier relationships, it also created a scenario where now we are looked at as an investment in the business, right? It's not a, a fixed cost center. Hey, we, you know, of course we need to maintain our systems. We need to keep them secure, but also what Jay's team is bringing, they're bringing us new ways to generate revenue for the firm. Well, in a scenario where you're just trying to hold on to figure out what this thing is going to shake out to be like, a lot of the, those, those growth-based initiatives took a backseat to just sure. remain, you know, keep, you know, keep keeping the lights on essentially. So we saw as far as our existing client base, we have a very loyal client base, really didn't have any, any turn there. But as far as new business, it was way down, way down for us. So what we real, we, we took it, we took that as a sign that since we weren't bringing on new business and I just made several hires. So we had this incredible team that we had built. But unfortunately, the, the amount of work that I thought was going to be there wasn't there. So what we did is we took that time to look internally. I'm a big EOS and traction fan. So we really defined clearly what our core values were. We put systems and processes in place in order to reward and a hiring system that would all that would all be based on these core values. We put together processes and procedures, workflows, mappings, diagrams so that we would be able to execute even more efficiently. So we focused on just how can we be better as a company and poise ourselves for the next phase of growth? Because I knew it was coming. It's, you know, the, the pandemic was going to be something that while it was a, a, a disruption, it was going to be temporary. 
So that really put us in a really great position to be able to take on the next stage of growth, which of course did come. Uh, 2020 passed and 2021 started off, you know, really a, a, a very uh, rapid pace. We were bringing on new clients and we had now the, the, the critical components, the foundation that we needed in order to sustain and support that growth. Excellent. And what I love is, you know, you, it sounds like you were able to retain your staff as well and, but put, you know, repurpose them in a way that, you know, it, it, it kept the business functioning, but also created new opportunities to shore up some of the processes, procedures, technologies, learnings, just get ready for future growth. Absolutely. What, what's you know, he, new for the tech now, given the change that we've gone through? Is anything different in how you're going to be delivering the value to your clients now as a result of going through all of this and what, is, what do you think has changed? What do you see out on the horizon? Yeah, so one of the first things we did when the pandemic hit and we took this internal look at ourselves is I wanted to understand what is our value to our clients. And so many companies get it wrong because when they look at their value proposition, they base it on an internal belief. But what I, one of the first things I did, especially with the, with the amount of staff that I now had is who were largely being unused, I had our new technical staff reach out to all of our existing clients to find out what value do we bring to you? Because what better way to figure out what your value proposition is than to ask the clients that you're supporting that are spending their hard-earned money on your product or service. So we got some incredible feedback from our clients as far as where they saw our value. And what I found out was it was actually amazing. One of the biggest value components my clients saw is our responsiveness. They really enjoyed working with us because of the fact that in a law firm setting, there are things that can wait and there are things that are mission critical that need to be attended to right now. And when those issues did occur, they knew that if they called us, someone would answer right away. And that was a big component of it. They wanted to feel like we were a member of their team and that at a moment's notice, drop of a hat, we could be engaged, figure out whatever the problem is, resolve it and get them back to operating as normal. So one of the things we did is we realized we had to create us the, the necessary ingredients that we were able to do that consistently, repeatedly and scale as and scale that with the business as we grew. So we actually put some metrics in place to ensure that we could get that response time as low as possible, because of course, of course, just like a budget, you would never run your organization or have a goal without putting the steps in place to ensure that you get there. You know, a budget, you have a revenue target that you're looking to hit, and that then gives you focus and clarity for your leadership team as well as the individuals who work in the organization to get you there. Same thing on with, with, with any initiative that you want to implement. So with response time being our key focus, we put initiatives, we, we put metrics in place to ensure that we were able to deliver that for our clients. And we, every time we have a weekly meeting, that metric would be delivered to me by my service team. You know, we'll take a look at all the service inquiries we received that previous week. And the fact that we knew that my service team knew that was a number we were looking at, it became an internal game, that, that concept of gamification that I think it was, was developed in the early 2000s. It was like, well, now we're, com we're competing against ourselves. How low can we get that response time? And then how much kudos can we get in our weekly meetings for, oh, wow, great job. We team, we overall this week, we have a five minute average response time. So it really created this incredible value because in my industry, and I know that Howard, you were in the IT space before, before you had transitioned into it, being a coach, you know, a one hour response time is considered very good. And by us being able to get that as low as five minutes consistently week after week, it just created this invaluable necessity for our services from our clients. Very good. Very good. And, 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 you know, it's really refreshing to hear, you know, how you have weathered the, the COVID storm and really, you know, have a vision for, you know, identifying the metrics, the value you're bringing, communicating that not only with your customers, your, your clients, but also get their feedback as well, because that'll continue to drive, you know, the improvement of those metrics. I love that. You know, let, let's, if we could shift to this idea of the relationship building. I mean, 
as I had shared with our, our listeners early on, you know, you and I used to uh, attend and, and for, in the back of my head as we're having this interview, I'm thinking, what were the names of those groups? So, but Chris Johnson, really the consummate networker. And we used to meet at two facilities out in the suburbs, but this idea of relationship building and networking, when did that kind of take off for you? Like there's value here. Cause a lot of these networking events, you pass out a business card, you talk about what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? And then potentially nothing ever happens. But this idea of growing the business, creating new opportunities, actually getting into some areas you hadn't even thought about comes about because of networking and relationship building. And it sounds like that's been a big part of your life as well, in addition to running the business. Absolutely. I mean, if you think back to how I got started in the business world, it was based on a relationship. It was based on one that at the time I stumbled into and didn't even realize I was networking. But by creating that core group of individuals who could elevate, inspire, and ignite passion within you, because let's face it, there are times where we all, we doubt our business model. We doubt the efficacy of it. We doubt whether it's that whether it's going to be something that can withstand the test of time. And you need that group of advisors around you that knows you and that can bolster you and say, you know what, you've got a great idea. You've got to keep pushing through. So really this, 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 this idea of relationship building was, was part of my core from the beginning before I even knew it. You know, you join, I remember one of the first groups I joined, professional networking groups I joined, it was a chamber of commerce and I would go to their monthly meetings and I was so excited at my brand new box of business cards, you know, straight off the press. They were still hot, you know, <laughs> and, and I pass out business cards and I get business cards passed to me. And like you alluded to, I just got really tired of spending time doing these things and nothing ever happening. You know, it's just this, it's this strange Thing that we expect to happen because I passed out my business card to 30 people in this room, something's going to happen. Well, the reality of it is you're giving a business card is telling someone who you are, but they have no reason to care who you are. So right. it, before you, before they even need to know who you are, they need to know why would they ever care to know who you are, which is why, you know, even in a scenario where, you know, you talk about like an elevator pitch, the, the age old elevator pitch, the thing that business professionals have constantly been trying to perfect since seemingly the beginning of time. Most people start off their elevator pitch with, hi, I am, ah, cancel, cancel, abort mission, abort mission. <laughs> You're telling me who you are before I care who you are. I, an easy, effective way to increase the impact that your, that your elevator speech brings, flip it. Tell us a story about a client that you've supported. Illuminate some pain that you solve. You know, one of the things I start mine with is imagine a scenario in which you're a hardworking attorney where you pour your heart, blood, sweat, and tears into your work product. And you have a, one of your clients tell you it's not good enough and that they don't believe you're responsive, that they have no idea what's going on with their case. So you being the smart, hardworking attorney, you devote more time. You work harder, stronger, more blood, sweat, and tears, only for that client to come back to you a week later and tell you that they will be leaving your firm and partnering with someone else, one of your competitors, because you just are not fitting the bill. Now, what if I told you that there were tools that you could leverage that would make you work smarter rather than harder, and that technology is the key to that, that you could be more profitable? So that's, and then I say, by the way, my name is Jay McAllister in Paragon Tech, and that's what we solve for our clients. Again, you give them a reason to care about who you are, and then your name sticks a lot, and it's a lot more memorable. So I think with this whole concept of relationship building, I realized that you had to be intentional about the individuals you were connecting with, and you don't do that by chance. You don't stumble across relationships that are high quality, and that will be mutually beneficial for both parties. Okay. I noticed, uh, I think it was either on Facebook or LinkedIn, you had a picture with Kevin O'Leary uh, from uh, Shark Tank and the head of Wonderful. advisors. Tell us about that. How'd that come about? So that was uh, 
Provisors National Networking Day 2021. Provisors is a professional referral relationship building group that I've been a part of for about a year. Not even actually, I think about a month will be my one year anniversary. And again, talking about intentional relationship building, one of the things that I do, I'll give you a, a, a secret into how I'm able to connect with individuals and, and develop these high quality relationships. I actually have a list that I call the Paragon 500. Shh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> and this list has 500 organizations and three people at each organization of those 500 that would be ideal clients for Paragon Tech. So what I do as far as all of my marketing, all of my outreach, all of my networking events, they're all structured around how can I connect with people in that Paragon 500 list, either referral partners of theirs or the direct client themselves. So I try to find organizations and events where those people will be likely to be. Provisors was one of those organizations. 60% of the members in Provisors are law firms between in my target uh, market range, right? Sure. Or they're referral partners to other law firms who are in that, tar- that same target uh, demographic. So I joined Provisors as a way to get access and start building credibility even further within the legal space, right? I figured if I could get to know and become friends with more attorneys in Chicago and abroad, Provisors is a national organization, that I would be able to lend lend myself credibility and start labeling myself as a content matter expert in my field. So Provisors took notice of this, you know, within my first I think, six months, I had scheduled uh, one-to-one interviews with every single attorney in the Chicago region within Provisors. It's about, about 250. We had set up one-to-one Zoom meetings oh, wow. and we were able to exchange and just build really great relationships and, and, and start the foundational elements of becoming friends. And Provisors took notice of this and invited me to be a panelist for their networking day, which is the, the, the event you saw on LinkedIn with, with, with Kevin O'Leary, Mr. Wonderful from Shark Tank and Matt Toledo, who's the CEO of Provisors. That's fantastic. So now, now your, your presence and, you know, it's going to be much more expansive just given the, the nature of that sharing. How do you use LinkedIn? Just thinking about it now for your networking and because some people, they have a profile, they never touch it after they crafted it right out of college. They have basic information. Here's who I am. Here's what I do. And that's it. They don't invest in using it. How are you and your team using the LinkedIn? Sure. Well, LinkedIn, when it first began, LinkedIn was the electronic resume, right? It's a place where you could go and you find jobs and you list your work experience and now it's changed so much, it's become the social platform. The way I use LinkedIn is really a way to stay top of mind for my clients and, and referral partners, as well as prospects. So it's all about branding. I'm very intentional about the kind of content that I post on LinkedIn. A lot of it is light, comical. Again, you have to be authentic when you're looking to build high quality relationships. So I don't, I mean, I, I have a drum set in my background right now. This is the same background that I use to network on National Networking Day. This was in my background. Why? I've I've modeled model Corvette cars in my background. I see the uh, I see the Corvette car too. <laughs> I, and I know we don't have video on the podcast. But we're gonna I, I, we're gonna take a picture of this and we'll share it on the show notes. <laughs> perfect, perfect. So you know I'm what. This is a floral shirt. You know this is not uh, <laughs> what you would consider. You know business attire. The reason I do this, people can, they can detect when you are withholding information from them. And if you're living, it's, it's such a strange thing. And COVID, I think, illuminated this. It's, it's, we're encouraged to live this psychosis where we have this, what they call the work-life balance, right? right. Where we're encouraged to live dual identities. We have our work persona and we have our home persona. People can tell. They can tell when you're being when you're being your work persona, your professional persona. Obviously, there are certain rules of engagement that need to take place in the work environment, right? But if you have bifurcated to such a degree your two personas where they're completely different people, people can tell. They see through it and you come across as phony. So this is my world. This is an invitation into my world, into the things that I care about. You know, people ask, am I a drummer? 
that's very subjective. Depends on who's asking. I tell, you know, drummers who are very accomplished that I have a drum set. I don't know if that makes me a drummer, but it's there. Uh, I was going to ask you to go get on your drums and, you know, <laughs> let, 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 let's see you put it to work, but that's okay. Howard, you, 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 you'd like to keep your audience on the podcast, <laughs> right? Let's just. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll, 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 we'll settle for the picture then, but very cool. Right. Where do you see yourself going? I mean, you're, you're again, you're, you've got a really great presence. You're, you have passion. You've got your business. You're the CEO, uh, growing company. You've got a reputation. Again, the consummate relationship builder. Where do you see yourself going so that you not only can have an impact for yourself, but I also suspect it's the it's continue to have an impact in the community because that's that lends itself to the greater value is, is making a difference in the community and the people who cross your path so you know and, and you're relatively young and dare i say you're less than half my age <laughs> that's but you know I'll, i could deal with that but where do you see yourself going in, in that kind of some new new aspects of your life perhaps that you're just starting to contemplate yeah, I think that'd be interesting. What do you, what do you, what do you have on, on the horizon for yourself? Yeah, there, there's a lot there. There's a lot there. So let, let me say this. You, you mentioned helping others in the community and people that come across my path or that I cross paths with. One of the things that, well, first of all, let me say, let me just dispel a myth out there because when we're talking about relationship building and connecting, I made a, a LinkedIn post about this a, a couple, I think it was a week ago or so. There's a difference between a connector and what I call a power connector. Right. A connector is a nuisance. You don't want to be a connector. If you are just without, you know, without intentionality and without the discernment, sending and connecting individuals that probably have no business being connected, but you think you're being helpful, stop doing that. You're creating a distraction for both of those people because you know, we all hate getting the email where you see who someone is, you realize that they're probably not a good fit. That person probably realizes that they're not a good fit. And you feel indebted to the person who made the connection and is CC'd on that email. So you say, yes, I'd love to talk to you and, and talk about potential synergies, right? And you know, there's nothing that's going to come out of that. I've meeting. been on some of those conversations. Right. right. And, you, and you agree to a 15 minute spot because you think, no, let's just stop doing that. The goal is to be a power connector. What's the difference? A power connector uses discernment. They get to know you as an individual. Never send a connection for someone you just met. I just met this person. I thought you know, it would be a good, you probably don't know about enough about them to know that it would be a good introduction. And you don't know their work ethic. You don't know, there, there's too many unknowns. So now you're creating a distraction for that other person. So a power connector, someone like Maury, who you saw me in, in a picture with on LinkedIn the other day, Someone such as yourself, Howard, you use discernment when you're sending, when you're connecting individuals. So that's just a quick aside. Don't be a, don't be a connector, be a power connector. Okay. Now, the, the other thing you mentioned is um, where do I see myself going? I mean, I think there's, just, there, I mean, there's so many avenues. It's, it's sometimes, you know, I, I've never been clinically diagnosed with ADHD, but I'm pretty sure there's, it's in there. I find it's difficult to maintain focus because there's so many things that, that entice me and I have a lot of hobbies and interests, but one of the things I can say is that the common theme for me is I found that I can, I tend to be a very good judge of character and there are so many people who I've crossed paths with over the years. And I've just thought to myself, man, I really wish I could make a major impact or have a major impact on that person, make a major difference for them in their life. But maybe I didn't have the resources or the time. So one of the things I would love to do my, this is getting very you know, waxing, you know, this is, this is going to get deep here. So if you will, okay, uh, allow me to, we can know. handle it. All right. All right. Love a sophisticated audience. You know, one of the things that I would love to do is I would love to be able to start within my own community and eventually travel the world and meet 
really interesting people with great ideas and great values and great morals, but maybe just do not have the resources to make their dreams come true. And I would love to be able to enable them in whatever way that means, whether it means leveraging my network to allow them to, you know, there's a product they want to patent. And I have a, you know, a patent attorney who can help them with the IP, you know, and I have a manufacturing facility that can, you know, help them to, to produce that part, whatever it may be, or maybe it's even financial. Maybe they have this great idea, but no one believes in them, but they have a great idea and they're, and they're a hard work and they're driven. I would love to be able to help those individuals. So that's a lot of what keeps me going, knowing that I can't have the impact that I would like to have unless I create the platform in which I can then take those resources and disperse them to individuals that I think really deserve a, a shot. No, I love that. In, as you were sharing that, I'm thinking there's there are organizations out there who maybe they have a product, a service, or they raise money to take, for example, wheelchairs to South America. Or and and, and in reality, I do know somebody, and that's what he and his wife do. <laughs> but now they're making a difference in the community that where healthcare and and mobility because of disability is is a constraint. But by giving the folks these wheelchairs, now all of a sudden they're they they have more options available. Or you know, in micro lending in South America and in in, in Africa and Asia, those are opportunities. And there's platforms where you can lend people, you know, small amounts, you know. $100 in one of those places is a lot different than $100 in, in Chicago. And so $100 in Chicago doesn't get you a Subway sandwich. Not at all. <laughs> not at all. But so I, I think there, there are opportunities out there. And so I, I think there's the creativity. But and again, this is where your relationship building will really come into, into prominence. Because as a relationship builder, you can start to go off and explore what are those opportunities? Who are the people that are doing things that I have this idea I might like to do? And either you get involved with them or you start something on your own. So I love the fact that you want to do that. And they're certainly on a global scale opportunity. So it would be very interesting to see how this journey kind of uh, takes off for you. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a combination of, we all have unique abilities. And we all have the ability to use those for greater good. And this is, and that's when we operate in our prime. That's when we're in our, that's where we're in the zone when we can combine as many of our interests and passions and put that into one single focused effort. And that would allow me to do that and take all of my passions and, and be able to do, do some really good things in the world. And that's what, at the end of the day, you know, getting that big you know, six figure paycheck, you know, that's, or, you know, getting the dream job or, you know, buying the car you always wanted, that stuff doesn't, that doesn't bring you true fulfillment. It's temporary, it's transient, it's there and then it's gone. The things that you do that create lasting impact. Like when, I, when I leave this planet, I don't really care if I'm remembered. I just wanna, the, the thing that I worry about and the thing that would make me take my last breath and go, that was a good life, is the fact that I know that through me, Others were able to explore their own passions and pursue them with relentless fervor. Like if I can do that for one person, if I can just enable them and inspire them, that's a life well lived. I love it. I love it. And on that note, you know, we didn't get into your uh, excursion or event with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Perhaps we'll have to get you back on the show to talk about that. And I'll tell you what, for folks that don't know, who is Jay, who is Neil deGrasse Tyson? Neil deGrasse Tyson is the leading expert in the field of astrophysics, somewhat of a, a celebrity, I would say. And uh, there's, I, I visited, uh, or Neil deGrasse Tyson visited Chicago a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things that he had to give as a disclaimer to the audience, just to give some flavor of who he is, this was a Sunday evening show. And before he started his show, he asked the audience, in this just very serious tone, I just want to ask, you're all here willingly to listen to an astrophysicist, an astrophysicist speak 
for two hours on a Sunday evening. I just want to make sure you all know you're here for that, right? And that just gives a, a true, that's just a, a portal into who he is and how impactful he is to people. He's just, I mean, he can take these concepts that are seemingly impossible to understand for a lay person. And you leave that seminar being able to, you know, teach a, a PhD level course. I love it. I love it. So definitely a great event. And it sounds like, and I, I'm, I, now I'm very fortunate that I follow him on Twitter so or Facebook, so I get to see what he's sharing. And so uh, spending two hours with him on a Sunday, that, that's, that's pretty nice. And, and you had that little private show event with him, the kind of like the after show uh, event. So congratulations on that as well. Hey, Jay, but if our listeners would like to learn more about you and your work, where are the best places for them to go? Best place to go for that is, of course, the lovely world of LinkedIn. You can follow me at Jay McAllister IT, or you can connect with me on my website, which is paragonus.com. Fantastic. Well, we will provide the backlinks to the website, paragonus.com, as well as we'll provide the link uh, back to your LinkedIn profile as well. And folks, uh, I definitely encourage you to get to know uh, Jay, wonderful individual. And I was going to say man, but he's a kid, you know, he's like half my, <laughs> less than half my age. It's like, oh my God. But that's what people like in the tech space, man. The young guys, you I, know, they feel, I, like, I, they feel at ease when the young guy comes in the room. I love it. I love it. And as I had shared with Jay, I'm going to be his, when he comes out West, I'm going to end up being his bag man. And I'll be happy to do that as well. <laughs> Listen, Jay, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the coaching and consulting insight series on success insight podcast. And so glad we, you know, the timing was right. I saw you online and said, Jay, let's, let's get you on and do a podcast and you are open to do that. So I, I'm very grateful and that you had the time and very appreciative as well. Awesome. Can I leave your audience with one inspirational quote that I saw this morning? I'm a big fan of inspirational quotes. Well, you know, it's funny, but we call those on the show and I occasionally do it. And as I was getting ready for the close, I'm thinking, what would Jay's insight to go be? So Without further ado, Jay, you know, on our show, we have this little segment called Insight to Go, where you share a quote, a conversation, a book, something that you want to leave our audience with. So, Jay, what's your insight to go? I would love to. This is a quote that I was just reminded of this morning, scrolling through LinkedIn. And it was actually, I'm not sure who first said this, but this was something that was shared by Elon Musk. And it definitely exemplifies the work he's done and how he's been able to accomplish so much in so little time. And it was this phrase, fail early, fail often, but always fail forward. I love it. Hey, if we don't get dirty, you know, we don't get into the ring and, and pick ourselves up, then we might as well not get into the ring. So I love that fail early, fail often, fail forward. Absolutely. Fantastic. Jay, once again, thank you for your time. It's been great. Awesome. Thanks. Take it easy. All right, folks. We have just been chatting with Jay McAllister. He's the CEO of Paragon Technology. And as we had also shared the consummate relationship builder and what a wide ranging conversation. We learned a little bit about his background and his, his propensity for tinkering and how that is then you know, taken on a, a new life as a really a trusted partner to, you know, law firms, you know, in Chicago, the Chicagoland area, and heck, given COVID, perhaps even beyond the Chicagoland area. But we've chatted about, you know, the, the really the, the aspect of relationship building and not just to be the consummate connector, but also to be the power connector and why it's important to not only you know, make the connection, but, you know, why do people connect? Why should two people get together? And it's in, there's some nuance there. And we learned a lot about that. Really some great insights into what it means to be a successful entrepreneur. I mean, as I'm kind of joking, you know, I'm 60, I can barely bring that out of my mouth. Jay's in his late twenties, but really been, you know, very successful and really making a difference in the community. So we are very grateful uh, that he uh, was able to take some time today, a Friday, to, to join us on the podcast and really to leave the this quote, this insight to go 
is to fail uh, early, fail often, but fail forward, which he shared from uh, a quote that he had seen from Elon Musk out on LinkedIn. And so we'll provide that, that quote as well in our show notes, as well as to his website, paragonus.com. And also we'll give you again the link uh, to his LinkedIn profile. Okay, folks, uh, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go out there, have a phenomenal day. You know, we want you, let us know what you thought of today's podcast, the Coaching and Consulting Insights on Success Insight Podcast. You can find us on LinkedIn and on Facebook, successinsightpodcast.com. We are on all of the major podcasting platforms, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Audible, and especially Spotify, where we actually have organized all of our coaching and consulting insight episodes into a playlist. So lots of opportunities to let us know what you think of the podcast, you know, what you like, questions you have, and hey, did you go out there and connect with Jay? Okay, let us know that. But until then, again, take care of yourselves, practice social distancing, if it makes sense, wear a mask if it makes sense. But above all, take care of the community, all right? Because we're all in this little boat together. And uh, we'll see you on another episode of the Coaching and Consulting Insights series on the Success Insight Podcast. Take care now. Success Insight is a production of Fox Coaching and First Story Strategies. Find us online, successinsightpodcast.com.